What is the role of established organizations in trying to bring breakthrough things to market, to try and be part of this transcend concept? And of course, it seems in some ways anathema because you optimize to protect the, the larger your entity gets, you optimize to do what you're already doing to protect the entity itself, as opposed to perhaps sometimes you lose sense of the mission or the purpose. And so I've asked a, a panel to come together to explore that. Uh, but before we do that, before I invite Kaihan Krippendorf and his esteemed panelists to the stage, I want to play a clip from Twin Global 2019. Um, this is a clip of a panel led by Sam Podolikio. Uh, and one of the panelists, uh, there's also, um, there also are uh, two other panelists uh, Evo Dalder, uh, the head of the Chicago Council, um, and uh, the, the, the third person escapes me, but you're going to see him on the screen in a second. Uh, but Wendy Sherman uh, has now become the Deputy Secretary of State. And she made a very interesting comment that had nothing to do with corporations, this panel. This panel was about global affairs and where the world might be going in terms of peace, and unfortunately now we know war. So I want you to think about Wendy's comments as we consider the role that corporations play in the world. If we could roll the video. People feel incredibly uncertain all over the world. They feel uncertain about what the future is going to be like. What is artificial intelligence going to mean they're not going to have a job anymore? Will climate change mean that their house will disappear? Uh, that the place where they live will be underwater? Uh, what, what will that future be like? What's it going to be like for their kids or their grandkids in my case? And they're also sort of thrown off by rapid social change. Um, because we have mobility, because we have social media, because we are connected, because everybody can get a Coca-Cola wherever they live in the world, uh, we're not sure what's going to happen. We all, I certainly am very glad in the United States that people can marry whom they love. But for a lot of people, that happened very fast. And they don't know where they stand anymore, just like they don't know where they stand that their wives, who once stayed at home, now go to work. So the world has changed very, very rapidly. It makes people incredibly anxious. And when people are incredibly anxious, they look for certainty. And certainly often comes uh, with an autocrat. Uh, that was the rise of Hitler in Nazi Germany, who was elected. Uh, Madeleine Albright wrote uh, her famous book on fascism, uh, and Mussolini and Hitler were both elected by people who were concerned and became nationalistic and looked for certainty. So I don't think there is a government in the world that's doing sufficient planning, either for the changes in climate, certainly our government isn't, uh, we're relying on the private sector to do the job, quite frankly, and mayors and governors, uh, and we aren't, no government is really focused on the future of work and how that's going to change and where people are going to get their dignity from. For me, that's the crucible of the future. Where people are going to get their dignity from, that's the crucible of the future. The fourth panelist was Clyde Tuggle, who led Global for Coca-Cola, Global Affairs, Government Affairs for many decades. So with that, I'd like to invite Kaihan Krippendorf to stage to lead the next panel, The Corporate Mandate, Leveraging Legacy, Transcending Constraints. Kaihan and panelists, please join us on the stage. Great. Um, yes, we're all really happy to be here with you. And um, this is an important set of two questions, I think, right? Uh, it's estimated that it will cost between five and seven trillion dollars per year to execute the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, government can't do that alone. Entrepreneurs can't do that alone. So the questions that we want to address here is can large enterprises overcome the constraints of legacy and scale? And can they do good? But um, those are important questions to, to, to answer uh, for all of us. Who do we have here? Uh, we have Elisa Ellis. She's the Global Head of Innovation and Emerging Mar Markets at Discover. Uh, we have Lindsay, Lindsay Androsky. She is the CEO of Royvant um, Social Ventures. Um, we have Toby Redshaw. He's the CEO of Veris uh, Advisory. And we got Debu, Debu I'm going to get this right. 3233. Three, three. <laughs> Porkayasta. 
No. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, uh, CEO of Roy Van, uh, 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 sorry, of, um, of uh, he has so many, you've done so much, right, with, 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 with Google and M&A and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and VC. Uh, and a spin companies. bowler. Third eye capital, yes, excellent. Um, so I'd like to just give each, each, each of you a chance to introduce yourself, and if you could just say what kind of work you do or have done inside this intersection, which you've all, you've all worked inside this intersection of large-scaled enterprises and agile, small, growing things, right? Um, could you, um, if we start with you, Elisa? Sure. Hi. So unlike uh, what the panel said, I'm not a founder of a... <laughs> of a business in Turkey, but... <laughs> you are so on I'm, the internet now. I am, yes, I'm impersonating somebody. Uh, no, but I, I think of the panelists here, I'm the one probably, uh, the only one that's still inside a large enterprise. Uh, and my focus is trying to get that large enterprise to do uh, more innovative things, to move a little faster and to think uh, like a smaller company. So we talk about that, uh, about turning the cruise ship by degrees, right? So when I've come to the twin before, I've said that's been my personal mission is how do you make the cruise ship turn? Um, and so uh, maybe to your question, can corporate uh, large enterprises do that? Well, I think I'm a believer in yes, because I'm still trying, <laughs> but... Uh, my co-panelists can maybe give you a different idea of what their answer is to that. Thanks, Lindsay Androsky. I'm the founder and CEO of Roy Vance Social Ventures. And I am really trying to um, push a new model of corporate philanthropy that allows employees to be fulfilled and use their professional expertise to more directly do good than they get to experience day to day on the job. So the model is um, that we take charitable money um, and we couple that with expert volunteers from across the corporate entity, which is now around 800 people. I'm able to staff those people on projects in their areas of expertise and help new companies that we will invest in, incubate, as well as other projects um, you know, where we have partners such as academic and uh, medical research institutions. We're in the healthcare sector. Um, and that's my uh, answer for helping corporations uh, do more direct social good. I found corporate philanthropy generally to be too fluffy, um, and uh, and I found non traditional nonprofits to lack the expertise um, to really help make a make a sustainable difference. So we're trying to blend those two things. Use our expertise, which was in launching and incubating new companies, and help others who are social entrepreneurs to do that. Things that we wouldn't invest our investor dollars in but that will still be sustainable businesses and do good for the world. Before we move on, just to have people understand kind of the area that you're working in and the scale, could you just like talk about number of launches or IPOs or things that have come out of Yeah, that? sure, so I have borrowed a lot from the Roy Vance Sciences model. I joined the founding team there um, at the beginning of 2016 and I built and ran our deal team. So that is, uh, I, I saw it grow from, you know, I was employee number 10 up into 800 in that time, we launched 16 biotechs. Um, we now have five approved drugs uh, for patients from those biotechs. Our business model was entirely taking shelved or deprioritized drugs. So things that a, usually a big pharma, but sometimes a biotech had invented, developed to a certain extent, and then for business reasons, decided to stop pursuing development of. We would use our expertise to say which things can still be good for patients We'd take those rights in, build new companies around them, and incubate them. Great, thank you. Toby. So I'm Toby, and it's my first time at Twin, and I'm loving it, it's fantastic. <laughs> um, lots of interesting, fun people. Um, so I've got this weird uh, background where I was very, very lucky to have a business job, a technology job, and an innovation job everywhere I went. Uh, initially at FedEx, uh, which was a very innovative place to be, and then at places like Motorola, American Express, Verizon, um, Aviva over in the UK that wanted to do big, uh, big innovative uh, transformations. So I always got to do startup stuff at the same time. So I think between 
you know, from executive chairman to employee to advisory board to board, I've done 40 of those. So I got to do all of those four things at the same time. Um, looking back, every company I went to after FedEx to do a big transformation innovation thing, I would only go if it was a disaster. Because <laughs> otherwise I'd go, like I went to Motorola and they were secretly almost bankrupt, right? Which is a bit naughty, but uh, to keep that kind of secret. Um, they had 70,000 more employees than, than they needed. Uh, just horribly run company. Um, but without that, catalyst of we're almost dead, uh, this will not succeed in the future. Uh, I'm not sure how innovative some of those giant uh, companies would be. And I'm, now I'm a, uh, one of the things I do, I'm a, a senior fellow, whatever, I think that's just fancy word for free labor, at the <laughs> Council on Competitiveness in, um, in DC, uh, trying with a bunch of really big companies, right? The chairman of Shell, the chairman of Bank of America, these sort of folks trying to get better public-private partnerships uh, to drive innovation. Otherwise, we will not be uh, competitive uh, versus China or France or the Nordics or uh, UK, who have done some brilliant things, um, especially over in Europe, on that public-private partnership that we just sort of ignore. Yeah, you, you bring in um, public sector as well. I guess we're going to uh, incorporate that into the conversation. It's a good point. I, I just did. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Nailed it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. So my name is Sebu. I'm the guy with the long surname, as you yes. saw just now. <laughs> so yesterday, we actually all sat down and we had our roles. Toby didn't know what he wanted to do. Alyssa was going to support. I was going to decide what I was going to do. But generally, I was going to say no to the motion. <laughs> but going back, so what I do for a living is I run a venture fund out of London. It's called Third Eye. Everybody writes Third Eye Capital, and then some people take selfies on the site. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Prior to that, Google for many years running uh, the M&A and the investment side and the, the new business side of it. And so I've seen one part of this journey. Prior to that, online travel. And before that, I was a banker on Wall Street. In, in a funny way, I wear a different hat. I sat on boards of a couple of educational institutions. So at Cambridge University, I get to see the same side again, where we try and get our own startups to come out and prosper, either, on the, either in the US or in the, or in the UK. And what I get to see is, does this really work? It works under certain controlled circumstances. That's a big corporation doing innovation on the side. And the issue that most big corporations face is, unless it is core to their pure, their main business, it 99% of the time never works. And the only time it works is under a set of control circumstances, which is you buy a company, leave it alone, like Google did with YouTube, bought it in 2004, and even today, for all practical purposes, works independently, but gets all the resources of the, the mothership. Okay, well then I think what leads us to the, I think the next question to kind of lay the table, which is what, is the big constraint. Certainly there's a confluence of many constraints and complications, entanglements. Um, but in your experience, um, what is the, what's the biggest one? Maybe I'll start with Toby. Biggest one is uh, just incentives, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at the, especially for public companies, if you look at the pressure of quarterly earnings, um, like at Motorola, we bought 20 fantastic cool startups and murdered all of them um, <laughs> because you know, the innovative people at the center, like me, would get these super cool things and everybody would get a pat on the head and you'd, you'd integrate them and you'd insulate them so they didn't get all the bureaucracy and you'd, you'd help them sell and you'd do all the things that were in the business case for buying them. Then you'd migrate them into a business unit where every quarter the CEO of that business unit is looking at hundreds of millions, if not billions. And then you've got this startup that's doing 50 million a year. It doesn't even register. And then when that guy looks at what he's rewarded for, nothing to do with that startup is on his list. And even worse, if it wins, he goes, yeah, those morons at headquarters are going to get a medal for this. <laughs> so I really don't give a you know, flip. And, um, and they die, right? HP did that to 25 software companies. Uh, Motorola killed a bunch. Um, when I was at Verizon, we killed 10. Um, we literally bought a startup and said, okay, all the marketing people now need to go to the marketing department. The engineers need to go to the engineering department. I went, wait, it's a startup. It kind of 
Yeah, so, and that's, it, it, you could call it bad leadership, you could call it lack of vision. It's really just a lack of incentive alignments because mm -hmm. people inside companies do what they're rewarded for, right? Gotcha. My job was to support that and I can jump in. Yes, um, I, I actually think it's large companies uh, forget um, kind of where they came from. They sit here and say, look, I've been really good. My market share is great, right? Stock price is going up. I'm doing all the right things. And uh, it is very easy from that perspective to remember that someone out there is newer, hungrier, or solving the problem in a different way, which I think goes to incentives, right? The idea yeah. is how do you keep your current uh, share price going? How do you keep your current track record? Which means it brings the focus much more into the present world. Uh, and you lose a little bit of that humility, which got you to where you are in the first place. That hunger and the humility to say, I don't have all the answers, I gotta work really hard, I've gotta figure out the next hard problem. I, I can speak, I've yes, seen please. both of these, mm -hmm. um, and they both played into what I do now. Um, so uh, I, I, when I describe it, I say it's a curse of success. So like I said, I was at the company at the very beginning, and then we grew very large, and we had literally billions of dollars to deploy for projects. And we started saying no to things that we would have said yes to five years ago. And it's for a very practical reason. It, the, the work required to do a deal doesn't vary that much based on the size of the deal. And so if we're only going to be deploying $50 million for something, it's not worth our time. And that is a twisted mm -hmm. system. Uh, an example that we had, one of the first deals I did was, um, it's one of our now approved drugs. It's, for, it's called congenital athymia. It's for babies born without a thymus, which is how your immune system gets trained. They universally die by age two. There was a treatment at Duke University that we found um, where you would take a discarded tissue from the heart of babies, other babies who needed surgery, culture that, put it in the quadricep. There were teenagers alive because of this. There are only 25 people approximately per year in the United States born with this. It's my favorite uh, you know, drug that we developed and have approved because it very clearly saves lives. There's no way we would do something like that now. My vehicle, my entity allows us to say yes to those types of projects even though they're relatively cheap and small. And Debbie, you, I'm, I, I'm just addressing right. it the yeah, same please. way yeah, around. Yeah, so at Google, we did for three years, we did 55 deals a year. So that's what, a little over a deal a week. And the only way you can do it at that scale with only 10 people in the team is you bring it down to almost like a process. You yep. do a deal like a process. What does that practically mean? So if you look at Google, and people don't realize it's only three products at Google came from inside. Search, which is what everybody knows. Mm -hmm. Chrome, Sundar is the CEO because of that. Mm -hmm. And the third one is Gmail, that's it. Mm -hmm. Everything else has been bought from outside. Mm -hmm. And the only reason it worked was we'd buy, integrate, have somebody really senior you know, be, you know, take personal charge. That's the only way it worked because at the, the deal table, that's the way we would sell it. And then you put major focus on that particular one. But he also knew that most of these were not, never going to work out, right? Mm -hmm. And the broader point that I'm making is that whether it's small or whether it's large, you need to make a process that makes it work. And the simple metric I always think is, do the top five or top 10 executives, will they stay after you've done the deal for the next three to four years? If you can only do that one thing, mm -hmm. the deal works 80% of the time. Got it. Everything else is much of muchness. Yeah, and I think that's where we need to go um, with some of the time that we have left is we've laid out kind of the opportunity and the problem, but let's talk about some solutions and you've offered one solution that addresses the problem that Toby laid out. Um, what else have you seen um, maybe um, Elisa or Lindsay because you, you, you guys have done a lot of uh, trying to get that smaller thing through to this to scaling in partnership with right so what, what, what's your go-to tool or solution to me it's uh create a, a separate thing right so i think devu and toby both talked about that which is uh insulate it as much as possible from uh from the main company so if you can get a really smart group of people and almost protect them from uh the other processes, structures of the corporation, uh, give them a very, uh, so essentially run a startup within a company, right? So same constraints, you still have to make a case for why you need to get funded, 
you still don't get all the resources that you need or want. Um, but you have that uh, timeline and separate them. And so the reason my group exists and we came out of a product organization at Discover uh, Financial is because the time horizon is always different. As a product organization, we talk about aspiring to have an 18-month roadmap. You get to six and then something happens, right? Something happens, something blows up in your current environment and you go to put out that fire. And that long term planning or thinking about the next thing disappears. So by design, we're a group within that organization that doesn't have responsibility for the current fire, right? Our horizon is 18 month plus, and by creating that separation, I wish that separation was bigger, right? We need a bigger moat. Um, we think we get to think about those things and try to address them within the corporate structure. So kind of an ambidextrous organization. Yeah. I mean, put another yeah. way, if you have a model, which is how Wall Street works today, that you have to show growth every year yeah. at minimum 15%, otherwise yeah. you're toast. Yeah. You should, frankly, as a big company, you should forget about doing anything internally. Mm -hmm. Look pretty much inorganic. Mm -hmm. Do something internally that allows you to understand what's the inorganic next opportunity, and then do that next inorganic yeah. thing, which is very simply either buy a company yeah. or merge. Yeah. There's really yeah. very few other options that you got left. Yeah. But I really hope in the broader term, the whole Wall Street model of growth changes because nothing grows perpetually. Right, right. Um, you know, I think what's, what, what I think that we want to make sure we inject into this conversation is the why. Because you know, there can be people sit here, sit, and sit here thinking, well, why do we need large companies to innovate? If they don't, why don't they just die off and let the small companies take over? Um, does it matter? Yeah, so the, I just gave this talk in DC to a bunch of monkey marks that um, some of whom were brilliant. Um, the, if you look at the history of the world and you look at uh, societies uh, and nations that had declining GDP over a period of time, every single one of them had really bad outcomes, right? Um, ask Marie Antoinette, uh, <laughs> the, the fall of the pre in, uh, uh, from one party rule in Mexico, Early 1900s in, uh, in Russia, 1911 in Portugal, 1911 in, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in China, it really leads to bad things. You don't want to be um, so bad at international competition that you have no comparative advantage and your GDP goes down. So it's of national security, well-being uh, importance. Yeah. And when you look at what's happened in the last 10 years, take France, for example. Mm -hmm. Macron got together with um, John Chambers at Cisco and said, hey, in 10 years, if we wanted to be really fantastic at startups, what would we do? Mm -hmm. And he did this crazy long list, and they went to work on it, and they did all of it in 10 mm -hmm. years. If I was going to launch a startup now, I'd seriously think about doing it in France, France. rather than than anywhere around here. I also think there's a, back to the earlier point on what my friend from Discovery said. Um, Discovery. Uh, That's it, an inside joke. It, it's a credit inside card, joke. but it's also yeah. a TV show. It's a great time. Um, is, I don't is think company. Every big problem around this that I've ever seen is a combination of two things, and every single one. Something fundamentally wrong with the architecture, right? <laughs> what is your process? What is your approach to doing this? When you talk to people on uh, M&A stuff, they, they end up going, well, we just do the deal and then we get going, right? Well, what's your, how have you architected this? And they normally haven't. And the other is what you said, it's humility, which is the ability to go, I don't know, not really sure, let's get some grown up help, let's get some people in here. And that's not really their fault, it's the people above them who punish them for that attitude, right? Which yep. in corporations showing up and going, yeah, I don't know, we should get some consultants in here, that's normally frowned upon. So I'd love to, yeah, look, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear from Lindsay as well, because you also come yep. also from the policy side, you've got a legal background, small, big, what, why does it matter? And this might be yeah. the last. Uh, I find, um, I think about Clayton Christensen a lot in the work that I do, and that's what I would, you know, caution the big companies against, and that's really getting fat and happy is the way I think about it, and wanting to focus on the high return, you know, which, which we've seen the high rewards 
and um, you're going to lose out to the upstarts then because someone is going to take the, the cheaper, less attractive business, but they're going to do so through technical innovations that can eventually usurp you. It can be addressed through acquisitions um, or outside uh, partnerships, but you need to stay abreast of what's new and don't, don't get too comfortable in your, in your big position. I mean, put it another way, no company should grow beyond a trillion dollars market cap. That's the way I always see it. <laughs> because the moment you do that, you will explode at some point. You're never going to survive over time. And so why? Yeah. Why do that? And I come out of that world many years back, and then I worked on the one deal that is still the biggest ever M&A deal in history, which is AOL Time Warner. And I always say, I hope that, that kind of deal never, yeah. ever happens. Yeah. That great for a banker. Well. Yeah, I, but I, everybody else, yeah. disaster. All right, we had to, and we that's have my to, broader point. This is great. We have Trillion to have pesos to wrap. is OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think it's, so it's, this has really been great. I think it's important also, because at least the research that I've done show that 70% of society's most impactful innovations have come from either that public-private partnership or large enterprises. You wouldn't have the internet. You wouldn't have MRI. You wouldn't have DNA sequencing. You wouldn't have mobile phones. Um, and so I know we've just scratched the surface here. Um, but we've uh, reached the top of our time. And I want to thank you so much for the work that you do and for sharing some insights with us here. Thank you. Thank you. Sin sincere Mike, thanks to fair. all the panelists and Kaihan, thanks. thanks for your able moderating. Uh, a quick note I, I should have uh, made before, Kaihan Krippendorf, who founded the OutThinker Network, which is a great network of chief strategy officers from large and mid-sized corporations, and I are writing a book right now called Proximity for Columbia University Press, and we'll launch that next year at TWIN. <laughs>